Welcome to Manifesting History, a channel that brings the past to life through ghost stories and eyewitness accounts in historical sites from around the world. In our premiere episode, we're going to Charleston, South Carolina. Nicknamed the Holy City and founded in 1670, Charleston sits on the Atlantic and has several beaches as well as harbors, marshes, and historic plantation homes. But arguably the highlight of Charleston is the near five square miles of its historic district. If you want to feel as if you stepped back in time, you cannot get any better than this historic gem. But while its beauty and southern hospitality draws tourists each year, Charleston has a dark side. It's played its major part throughout history, including the American Revolutionary War and the American Civil War, not to mention the horrific slave trade and prisoner torture, including the execution of pirates, people being buried alive, the imprisonment of children, and even being home to America's first female serial killer. So if you're ready, let's manifest this beautiful city's haunting past. In the early 1800s, traveling tradesmen began to go missing. People suspected highway robbery. But it wasn't until one horrific night when a man by the name of John Peoples alerted the police and the terrifying truth was uncovered. John Peoples was on his way to Charleston when he grew tired and came across the Six Mile Wayfarer House, an inn outside of Charleston. He knew there might not be room available for him in town and he was hungry and tired, so he stopped at the inn. It was owned by John and Lavinia Fisher. John took his horse and wagon to be stored in the stable, and Lavinia took him inside and cooked him a meal. She was very attractive and even a bit flirtatious. After dinner, she made him a cup of tea. John was not a tea drinker. In fact, he hated it. But Lavinia kept insisting that he drink it, and even asked every few seconds how he liked it. He didn't want to hurt Lavinia's feelings, but also found her behavior to be suspicious. So when her back was turned, he dumped the cup's contents into a nearby houseplant and told her it was delicious. Lavinia escorted him to his room and wished him a good night. John Peoples tried to sleep, but he couldn't. He found it strange that Lavinia wanted him to drink her tea so badly, and even stranger was the fact that he hadn't seen the owner, John Fisher, all evening. He did not trust the Fishers now. He got out of bed and sat in a chair in the corner by the bedroom door so he would be ready if someone tried to come in and rob him. Unfortunately, he dozed off and awoke to a thunderous crashing sound. He jolted and looked around the room. The bed was gone. He walked to the center of the room and looked through the floor. The bed was dangling, bolted to what appeared to be an enormous trap door. John Fisher stood in the cellar below holding an axe. He looked up at John Peoples, who screamed and ran down the stairs and out the front door and did not stop until he reached town. By the time he got the police and some townsfolk together, it was morning. The Six Mile Inn was deserted. The Fishers had taken Peoples' horse and goods and abandoned the inn. In the cellar, police found several bodies and skeletons that had been buried under the dirt floor. Lavinia Fisher would entertain tradesmen while John inspected their goods in the wagons and saddlebags. He'd give Lavinia a certain hand signal through the kitchen window if the goods were worth stealing. Then she'd make her tea that contained heavy doses of laudanum to make her victims tired. Once they were asleep, John Fisher would pull a lever in the cellar that caused the bed on the trap door above to drop. Then he'd murder the victims with an axe and bury the bodies. They take the goods to different towns around South Carolina and sell them. The police eventually caught up with John and Lavinia and were, they were arrested and taken to the Old City Jail in Charleston. John Fisher was executed by hanging before his wife. Lavinia requested to be executed in her wedding gown. Her request was granted. She thought it would grant her sympathy from her accusers and she may be pardoned. 
She was brought to the gallows and asked if she had any last words. When she realized the execution was going to happen regardless of her effort, she faced the crowd in anger and said, If any of you have a message for the devil, give it to me, for I'm about to meet him. She was hanged on February 20th, 1820, on the grounds of the old city jail. Many have claimed to see a woman in a white wedding gown walking the ground. Some have reported seeing her standing behind them in the reflection of the windows of the jail. They've heard a female's voice and even crying. Some that visit or investigate the old city jail, mainly women, have reported being scratched by an unknown entity. Some believe this is the ghost of Lavinia Fisher. But she is not the only one said to haunt this eerie site. In the 2000s, the jail underwent renovations and was sealed off for some time to outside guests. Construction workers would find fresh footprints in areas where no workers had been. Strange noises were heard and one night a couple of workers witnessed what appeared to be the ghost of a former guard holding a rifle pacing the third floor and then vanishing before their eyes. The ghost of a little boy is also said to haunt the jail. During the unbearably hot Charleston summers, the iron bars covering the windows would heat and the entire jail would turn into an oven. This proved to be too much for the little boy who was imprisoned for stealing a donkey cart. He died of heat exhaustion. Giggling and small quick footsteps can be heard to this day. The Unitarian Church is the second oldest church in Charleston. Visitors will notice that the paths of the cemetery are well kept and manicured, but the rest is overgrown. The Unitarians wanted to be buried this way so that the dead and nature could be intertwined. The first haunting is that of Mary Whitridge. She lived with her husband in Charleston. He became ill and had extreme breathing problems. He took a trip to Baltimore to visit doctors to help him. On his trip, though, he died. The story has it that she collapsed and died in her home on the same day as her husband. Mary is said to rest in the family plot at the cemetery. The plot next to her is said to be her husband's, but it is empty. People say that Mary is the lady in white who roams and haunts the cemetery. Others say it's the ghost of Lavinia Fisher, who rumor has it was buried in an unmarked grave in this graveyard. Another haunting is that of Anna Ravenel who fell in love with a man named Edward. Edward was a soldier that was stationed at nearby Fort Moultrie. Anna would sneak out of her house frequently to visit Edward. Her father did not approve of their relationship, and because of his status, he was able to have Edward move to Baltimore, Maryland. While Edward was stationed in Baltimore, Anna fell ill. Once Edward heard about her sickness, he left to come back to her, only to come too late. She had died. Anna's father would not allow him to come to the funeral. He even kept the details of where she'd be buried from him so he wouldn't even be able to visit her gravesite. Edward eventually moved on and found a new calling as a writer. He would soon be known as Edgar Allan Poe and go on to write about his love, Anna, in a poem called Annabelle Lee. Anna can be seen walking around the cemetery looking for Edward. She appears at her unmarked grave waiting for her long-lost love. The Grand Victorian home that now houses Pugin's Porch at 72 Queen Street was built in 1888. In the 1970s, a family purchased the property. A little wiry-haired dog named Pugin was a neighborhood stray who would wander from porch to porch, always looking for his next meal. He was finally adopted by the family as the house was being converted into a restaurant. Pugin died in 1979, but it is said if you visit Pugin's porch today, you may catch a glimpse of a ghostly dog. Long before Pugin's porch, dating back to the early 1900s, a woman named Zoe St. Amon lived in the house with her sister Elizabeth. Zoe was a local school teacher and she and her sister grew into spinsters and spent most of their time indoors enjoying only each other's company. 
Sadly, in the year of 1945, Elizabeth passed away. With Zoe's lone friend gone from her life, she became even more withdrawn. Zoe's mental health quickly began to decline. Late one night, Zoe left her house and began walking down the street, hollering out her deceased sister's name. One of her neighbors checked her into the closest mental hospital, where she spent the remainder of her life. It's believed the ghost of Zoe haunts her old home, still looking for her sister Elizabeth. Reports of her spirit began popping up shortly after she died, but intensified once her residence was turned into a restaurant. Staff members and guests alike have seen her ghost wandering around the house. Others staying at the hotel located across the street from Pugans have reported seeing an elderly woman in a black dress standing at the top floor window. Late one night after closing, a staff member was cleaning up when she began to get this unnerving sensation that something was behind her. When she looked up into a mirror, she was startled to see the face of an old woman wearing wire-thin glasses. Shortly after the image of Zoe disappeared from the mirror, Zoe also seems to be quite active in the women's restroom, with reports of people seeing an old lady in the bathroom and also in the mirror. Right across the street from Pugin's Porch on Queen Street is the Mills House Hotel. In 1861, General Robert E. Lee came to Charleston to tour the city's harbor defenses. On his visit, he checked into the Mills House. A fire erupted at a nearby factory and spread nearly half a dozen blocks reaching the Mills House Hotel. Robert E. Lee and his staff had gone to the roof to witness the devastating inferno outside. When they returned to the parlor, they saw a group of women trying to escape from the hotel with their babies. Lee took one infant and another soldier took the other and they helped the women escape the hotel. Inside, the staff valiantly fought the fire off and saved the building from annihilation. While the original building was torn down and rebuilt in the 1960s, reports of apparitions resembling Confederate soldiers and Robert E. Lee himself running down the halls of the hotel continue to this day. St. Philip's Church was originally established in 1681 in Charleston. The beautiful cemetery is located across the street and adjoining the church itself. It holds some of the most well-known historical figures in Charleston's past, including Henrietta Johnson, who is recognized as the first female artist of the colonies. One of the signers of the Constitution, Charles Pinckney, is also buried in the cemetery, as well as Edward Rutledge, who signed the Declaration of Independence. In 1888, Gaston Hardy and Sue Howard were two members of the congregation. Sue was pregnant, and the two were looking forward to starting their family. But on June 10th of that year, the child was stillborn, and Sue was devastated. Sue mysteriously died six days later. About 99 years after her death, a photographer came to the cemetery to take photos. To his shock, he captured what appears to be a woman wearing a shawl bent over a grave of an infant. This photograph is still used during tours. It's said that women who are pregnant and hold this picture get a bad feeling and even have complications. Visitors have also reported hearing a crying baby in the cemetery. Built in 1859, the Battery Carriage House has switched owners several times until the 1980s when it was turned into a hotel. Employees and numerous guests have reported seeing spirits and hauntings at the inn. There are three rooms that are particularly eerie. The first encounter is from a married couple spending a few nights in room three. During the first night, the husband's cell phone started to make strange and loud noises even though he swore he had turned it off before bed. They also reported seeing orbs and flying balls of light all night. On the second night, they reported seeing the orbs again. 
They met with a psychic who was also staying at the hotel. They convinced her to visit the room. She could feel the presence and asked the spirit to leave. The couple said after that they could finally sleep and did not report any more hauntings on their stay. The most menacing ghost in all of Charleston seems to reside in room 8 at the Battery Carriage House Hotel. Guests reported that they fell asleep only to be awakened by the sound of hissing and harsh whispers. The room would fill with a thick fog and they would look up to see a headless floating torso. It would come rushing towards them, turn, and then disappear into the wall. The spirit seems hell-bent on terrifying guests. Room 10 is home to the gentleman ghost who reportedly crawls into the bed of unsuspecting female guests. Would you stay in any of these haunted rooms? The Dock Street Theater sits on Church Street in Charleston and is still in operation as a theater to this day. Two main ghosts haunt the theater. One is known as the ghost of Jonias Booth. Jonias was the father of the assassin John Wilkes Booth. A man believed to be a spirit can be seen backstage or walking across the stage when the theater is completely empty. The second ghost and most famous one is Nettie. Nettie lived in Charleston in the mid-1800s and would frequent this location when it was a planter's hotel as a prostitute. Nettie moved to Charleston from the city looking for love but fell on hard times. Nettie saved up her money and purchased the most expensive red dress that she could to wear while being at work. One night, she went outside to catch her breath on the second floor balcony. It began to sprinkle and thunder clapped. Before she could get back inside, Nettie was struck by lightning. People say that Nettie can be seen on the balcony or floating along the theater wearing her red dress. Edisto is an island just under an hour outside of Charleston. It is rural with tranquil beaches, Spanish oaks, and beautiful churches. One of these is Edisto Island Presbyterian Church, but beneath the beauty is something so horrifying it's straight out of a nightmare. Back in the mid-1800s, 10-year-old Julia Laguerre was visiting family on the island. She became ill and slipped into a coma. Her family anxiously awaited the day she would wake up, but that day never came. The family physician declared the young girl dead. Her little body was taken from the church and placed in the family's mausoleum. After she was placed inside the crypt, the marble door was closed and securely locked, providing a sense of finality to the tragic death of the child. After 15 years had gone by, another death in the family required the mausoleum to be opened. It was then that the family discovered the horrifying truth. Julia's remains, which had so long ago been entombed, were crumpled at the foot of the mausoleum's door. She had been buried alive. It is thought that her respiratory and heart rates had dropped so low that they were undetectable by the family's physician, so he had declared her dead. She had woken up in her own tomb next to the entombed remains of long-dead family members, where she was unable to escape and had to wait alone for her eventual death. The girl's remains were entombed once again, and the door was securely closed. Still reeling from the horrible discovery at the mausoleum, the girl's family members visited the cemetery a few days later. When they did, its door was open. Thinking that the open door of the mausoleum had been the result of being improperly secured at the recent funeral, they shut the door again and walked away. A few days later, a clergyman at the church discovered it open again. This happened again and again, until finally the door to the mausoleum was removed. Now that there is no door to the mausoleum, it is thought that Julia's spirit can finally rest, although some visitors claim to hear laughter and have captured images on their cameras that cannot be explained. But I like to think that Julia Laguerre's spirit is finally at rest.